Special and visual effects are magic tricks. Sleight of hand that transports you to another world, sometimes invisible, sometimes asking for your attention. And like we've done in two episodes before inside this series, we're gonna be showing you effects that utilize insane amounts of artistry and ingenuity and see if you can guess how these effects were done before we tell you. All right, so as always, you're gonna push play on the clip, watch the clip, and then try to guess how they pulled off that effect in the time period that it was made. Spacebar? Yeah, go ahead. Miniatures. So first one's miniatures with a little book laid out. Yeah, I'm gonna say miniature. Bram Stoker's Dracula was directed by Francis Ford Coppola, who set out to make this film in the most classic way possible. Even though this was released in 1992 when visual effects in the computer were really starting to take off with Terminator 2 released that same year and Jurassic Park coming out the very next year. But Coppola wanted to take a page out of the early days of film from artists like George Méliès. But what I love about this moment specifically is that it's working with miniatures and the opposite. Coppola wanted the train appearing to travel over the book with the shadow of the smoke from the train cast on the book as it moves. To do this, Gene and Christopher Warren used a miniature of the train and originally a normal sized journal that was placed right next to the lens. The problem was that wouldn't get the shadow from the smoke that they wanted. So they built a 20 foot version of the journal that could be placed close to the train with one light that would cast the shadow of the smoke onto the pages. These techniques that they chose to use for the film gave the entire thing an otherworldly feel that holds up to this day. That included doing things like multiple exposure tricks like this shot here, where Roman Coppola, Francis's son, who was the visual effects and second unit director on the film, got this moment all in camera with no post at all. They did this in camera by rolling on the rats running by with the rest of the image blacked out. They could then rewind the film in camera, flip the camera over, roll again with the other area of the film open for exposure, and now the rats area blacked out. Or the brilliant simplicity of this shot here where the candles appeared to come on as the woman comes down the stairs, where in reality, she is walking backwards as someone blows the candles out. The entire film is riddled with genius moments like this. If you haven't seen the film, put that to the top of your list. And after you do, check out the behind the scenes in camera directed by Kim Aubrey, which is where I learned about all of this. Links in the notes below for that. Is that a giant foot? Oh, that's a giant woman. Okay. <laughs> this is a, this is your first puberty dream. <laughs> You're just like, oh. this has to be a mixture of techniques. Force perspective on some of the shots. They just built a small pool, a miniature pool for her to get in and then did some force perspective. This shot of him facing and her away, that that's, feels like force perspective. Attack of the 50-Foot Woman was an HBO TV movie from 1993 and used forced perspective throughout to create the illusion of a very large Daryl Hannah. This technique is accomplished by placing two things at different distances from the camera to manipulate their actual scale, which we have shown that on the show a few times. If you place one actor close to the camera and one far, then adjust the actor's eye line to match, you can create tiny people or giant people all in camera. For this specific shot, which is my favorite from the film, Supervisor Gene Warren, the same Gene Warren that worked on Dracula, built a scale model of the pool that Daryl Hannah would be in and could then be photographed at an angle that would align perfectly with the real pool area in the background where Daniel Baldwin would play the scene from. That mixed with the camera move in the wide made this shot timeless. And you have, of course, seen forced perspective in hundreds of films with maybe the most famous recent examples being the Lord of the Rings films and Elf with Will Ferrell, both of which use the technique very effectively. Whoever was the representative PETA that they that they saw this movie was like, holy sh! That's actually really disturbing. What the hell? I mean, it would be too dangerous to literally do it and then just like guess when it's running out of breath. What kind of f***ing black market bullshit is this? Yeah, tell me, James Cameron. That's too realistic. They just trained a mouse. 
We covered a different effect from The Abyss on the last classic effects, but this film is just filled with incredible techniques that still completely hold up. Like most of Cameron's films, it is a bit of an effects goldmine. With this specific shot, the effect is there isn't one. This is an unsimulated moment of the rat breathing actual oxygenated fluid or oxygenated perfluorocarbon. In the documentary Under Pressure, Cameron talks about how they got the instructions on how to do it safely from Duke University. And directly following the shot, they sent the rats to a vet to get shots and make sure everything was okay. Even with all of those aspects though, Cameron was forced to cut the scene from its release in England because, I mean, it's pretty messed up. But the craziest thing is that the breathing fluid is actually real and something that's been around since the 60s with the first human trials conducted in 1989, the same year The Abyss was released. So bonus round. I'm st I feel stress. <laughs> what the hell? Dude does a good job keeping his eyes open. That's tough to do. Ed Harris, I just watched Ed Harris die. I mean, that one too, the first thing is they just did it. I, the only guess I have is they actually just did that with safety precautions. Of course, since the first Human Trials was in 89 and the film was shot in 88, Ed Harris did not do the same stunt the rats did. Instead, they filled his helmet with liquid and Harris just acted the rest. To see inside the liquid, he had to wear special contacts, but even with that, Harris said that his eyes would begin to sting within five minutes when down in the tank due to the chlorine used. And filming with a helmet full of water inside of a tank full of water does raise the danger. So the team made Harris's helmet one that could easily open in the front. This allowed allowed them to fill and remove water quickly and let him get to a regulator quickly as well. And the most challenging moment in that environment seemed to be this shot here, the moment where Harris's character is descending into the abyss. Since pulling him down at distance would make for some insurmountable challenges, the team instead turned the camera on its side and pulled him sideways. During one take, Harris signaled to the team that he needed oxygen, but the person who should be there for him wasn't. So another crew member swooped in with his regulator, but accidentally gave it to Harris upside down, causing him to breathe in a mixture of air and water. It wasn't until the cameraman hurried over and gave Harris his regulator that he was finally able to breathe again. But let's pause there to thank our sponsor, Licked. We've shown Licked a few times on the show, but if you haven't heard of them, this is the only place that I've ever heard of where you can license music like this. Or go old school with nostalgic tracks like this. Whether you're a YouTuber with millions of subscribers or just starting out. That last one is from my favorite ad that we've ever done. Link in the notes for that. But every time we post about Licked, there are several people who are skeptical about it or think there's a catch. And I get that because that was my first reaction before I used Licked, mainly because you come on the site and you find some of the biggest artists in the world here for you to license for your YouTube videos, including one of my all time favorites, Coldplay. But you also have all kinds of current mainstream tracks too, like this new song from Ice Spice and Nicki Minaj from the new Barbie film. And they have the biggest music catalog for creators with 150,000 stock music tracks for any situation and access to the biggest artists to take your production quality up while being protected from copyright claims. And it's just common sense, but also proven by data that audiences will watch longer and engage more when the viewer recognizes that mainstream music. It's sort of something that we can all communicate through and relate to together at the same time, which can help you grow. The stock licenses can also be used on any social platform with unlimited usage. They have solid search filters and hundreds of curated playlists. And by supporting Licked, you are supporting the artists as well. And the more creators use the platform, the more labels Licked can sign on. So sign up to Licked and use our link below for 14 days free stock music and 50% off your first mainstream chart track. And this is a limited time offer, so be sure to jump on that now. Man, they got that shit on a string. Some of it feels, gotta be a nightmare on a crane like that. To do some of it looks like a real feather. And then when it stops or pauses, it looks CG. In camera on a string, that is my guess. 
otherwise witchcraft. Unless it's just fully CGI the whole time, but at the end, when it finally stops moving, you go, oh, that's a real feather. It looks real. But for most of it, it just looks like CG. I love this one so much. It's so simple that it's almost silly, but it works insanely well. And more importantly, it's a perfect way to open this film. The effect was used to set the tone, a leaf floating on the wind. It works thematically and adds a whimsical feel right out the gate. And action! And it was done by first getting their plate, a large orchestrated crane shot that they could then take to post to use as the guide for the feather, which was not CG, but instead a real feather in front of blue screen. They had the feather connected to fishing line, essentially, with a fan blowing right below the frame, keeping it floating. Then they could, of course, composite that in and adjust the scale position and rotation to work perfectly with the shot. But then you have this final moment when the feather lands on Tom Hanks's foot. For this, there was a feather all always there on the shoe, which they painted out in post so they can combine that blue screen feather and the in-camera feather perfectly. And if you go frame by frame, you can actually see the imperfections in the paint out here on the shoe, which I never noticed until I researched this episode. Isn't this the movie where they actually just did everything? <laughs> nah, I'm good, bro. Nah. This is the movie with like the crazy stories where like a bunch of people almost got like mauled or some Can't remember what it's called. Nah, I'm good. No, that's okay. Nope. Yeah, they actually just did all this stuff. Nah. Is this that 73 movie where they just like got bit by lions like 87 times? And here's another cheat because once again, there are no tricks here. The effect is, well, trauma, because the director, Noel Marshall, was a lunatic that put his cast and crew right into the mix of untrained lions. Originally, Marshall wanted to rent Hollywood trained lions, but when that didn't work out, they decided to buy a bunch and raise them themselves, because, you know, why not? The film took 10 years to make with five years of actual photography, during which people being mauled was something that happened frequently, with several of those real moments being used in the film, like when Marshall's then stepdaughter, a teenage Melanie Griffith, was attacked by one of the lions, leaving her needing facial reconstructive surgery. The film was also DP'd by Jan DeBont, making this his first US shoot, and he didn't come out unscathed either. DeBont was actually scalped by a lion and needed 120 stitches to reattach the skin to his head. And then he went back to work, as you do. There's plenty we could say about this film, but it is one insane piece of cinema. Oh, I know how they did this one. Didn't they just like attach actual like subwoofers or bass to the car to make it ripple like that? Somebody was just playing the guitar under the car. If you watch the show, you're well aware of my deep, unflinching love for the original Jurassic Park, and this specific effect has always been one of my favorites, with one of the main reasons being how elegant and effective it is to build the tension and signal that coming danger, but also because they pulled it off in this incredibly cool way. The idea came to Spielberg while listening to music in his car and seeing the bass shake his rear view mirror. So he wanted that shot and the shot of the water. The first shot of the mirror, easy enough, but how could they pull off the one with the water? An effect that Michael Lanteri said was one of the most difficult effects to pull off. Spielberg wanted specific concentric circles in the water that they could trigger on cue. You couldn't do it, I had everybody working on it. And finally messing around with a guitar one night, I set a glass and started playing notes on a guitar and got to a, a right frequency, a right note, and it did exactly what I wanted it to do. So they attached a guitar string to the SUV, plucked it, and they had their effect. Is this Independence Day? What is this? What am I looking at? Feels like this, it feels like that. Like some projection stuff, it feels like some miniature stuff ink and water because the first image looks so projected but that i think it's just the resolution but i'm gonna go with a lot of things this specific effect comes from an older technique used in films like Raiders of the Lost Ark, Ghostbusters, and Close Encounters of the Third Kind, where a cloud tank is used to get these great cloudy effects. For this specific shot, the filmmakers placed a rig of halogen lights and tubing with holes drilled into it inside of a tank of water. With the rig submerged in the water and the camera rolling at 360 frames per second, they moved the rig forward while pushing tempura paint through the tubing, which created this amazing effect of billowing clouds moving toward us while 
glowing from inside. They could then composite that in with their other elements to end up with one of the most iconic sci-fi shots of all time. But that is it for today. This is a series that we're going to keep doing. So if you have some shots that you'd love to see explained on the show or just some that are your favorites, post those in the comments below. And until next time, don't forget to write, shoot, edit, repeat. <laughs>